My name is Kevin McGee, and I'm the Decision Superiority Portfolio Manager. Go on to the next slide, please. So, Decision Superiority. You, you notice we chose names that are somewhat nebulous. Um, that's just to keep you guessing. Um, decision Superiority, the way we've defined it within our portfolio, is the ability to provide the right information to the right people at the right time. And that is not just information, but that information has to have a pedigree and be of high integrity so that the warfighters can count on that. Because the key is staying inside your adversary's decision loop and being able to outthink them, outsmart them, and move faster. So that's what decision superiority is in, in our portfolio world. Um, it's broad. It encompasses a lot of things. I rely on my counterparts here and across all our competencies for capabilities to be able to put those systems together. Um, you see our top customers there um, heavily focused on Marine Corps and on PEOC4I. Um, we do a lot of work across the board, though, for DOD and other federal entities, and you'll see some of that here coming up. Um, go ahead to the next slide. I like to use this chart. It's a little different than, than the way other people recognize it. Um, if you were listening closely to Mr. Miller, you heard him say we are a matrix. So rather than representing the portfolio in a hierarchical organization, um, I tend to uh, like to show it in a matrix. The big and little dots are representative of the competencies that we currently are using to fill out our IPTs. And so currently, as organized, we're using about 621 government people across our organization to fill out our integrated product teams and currently employing over 2,500 um, industry partners on those teams to meet our requirements. Go ahead to the next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the different sub-portfolios. I have, currently have seven sub-portfolios, and, and, and Chris talked about the air traffic control and containerized ATC to go, he like to call it. Um, but they've had a lot of significant accomplishments recently in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and not just delivering ATC capabilities. I mean, one of the things I like to talk about is different communities within our services, um, CENTAF came to us, we were delivering air traffic control for them, but they wanted to reduce the risk of fratricide. And so running air operations in theater at the same time as you're running civilian aircraft, air traffic control and military aircraft, um, they were slow to clear airspace. And so what they did was they organized, they wanted to put together air operations and air traffic control together into a single facility and be able to rapidly clear airspace and then run operational missions. And so that is two different communities within our services, and, and they don't normally work that close together. They communicate through communications, and it takes a little longer. But when you're sitting next to them, you can grab them by the scruff of the neck and say, clear this airspace, it happens a lot faster. So we built a 14-container containerized systems all integrated here and delivered in theater um, and set up and operated. And it was uh, a significant accomplishment. It was one of the first times that that had been done in our warfighting history. Um, moving on to the command and operations centers. Um, you guys can read the slides. So if you notice, I'm not reading the slides to you and just telling you a little bit about it. But one of the significant accomplishments we just completed uh, recently was uh, doing CENTCOM forward headquarters in Qatar. Um, General Petraeus's new facilities overseas um, and outfitted that whole facility with C4I capabilities. Um, significant accomplishment, took a long time, and frankly, um, state-of-the-art capabilities. As we move on to the next slide, enterprise services, you know, that's another one of those big nebulous things. We could have called it cloud. We could have, you know, people like to use, tar we, you know, people want to talk about the cloud. Well, what is the cloud? It's one of those nebulous terms. Again, it doesn't have a lot of meaning until you really dive down into it. But I would tell you that 
Spayward Atlantic probably has some of the brightest people in enterprise services, um, platform as a service, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, um, whatever the next terminology is going to be, call it cloud, call it what you will. But our engineers are leading the way across DOD and federal organization and how to build that for the federal government and for DOD. And so we're doing a lot of different things in that area. Um, some of the interesting things recently completed was um, connecting, improving that CANES, the Navy's network of float and enterprise services of float could federate with data across the NCES, the national level. Um, enterprise services, and we're tying that now to the Marine Corps to do a demonstration that we can do it across to the Combat Operations Center, the Marine Corps' tactically deployed capabilities. So um, significant accomplishments in those areas. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the other things that I think are really cool that we did there was um, since I joined the civil service back in, well, we want, it doesn't matter when that was, but anyway, since back in the 80s, this whole thing, and I talked about communities of, of real-time command and control, weapon systems command and control by C4I, and what's real-time, what's not real-time, but, but we would never really share data. We, uh, back in the late 80s, I think they connected a serial cable between the two, cut off the transmit pin, and um, we're allowing the combat system to feed some data. Well, we just completed a limited technology experiment sponsored by ONR that for the first time actually connected the networks together and allowed data to flow from the combat system to canes afloat. And this year we're still in the midst of uh, that another limited technology experiment to move data back the other way to the combat system because there's pieces of data that the combat system wants from the C4I world. And that is a huge leap in it's not a, as much a technology leap as it is as um, two communities not trusting each other. So recently completed that, and we're working in the world of, uh, we call it handheld command and control for the Marine Corps, um, your smartphone, taking the smartphone to the battlefield. There's a lot of things we do in our daily lives that we take for granted, and one of them is all the capabilities on your smartphone. Take those into the combat world. Seems like an easy transition, but when I go back and I talked about integrity of the data, integrity of the information, for us, the key is being able to lock it down so that we can show the pedigree of the data so that the warfighter has confidence in the data they're getting through that path. And that's a lot harder than it sounds. Our 5-8 competency, um, Mr. Kutch and some of the folks from his portfolio, it's a significant challenge. And that's where the stumbling block is for DOD to actually make use of those kinds of things. Um, talked about a, a lot about our Marine Corps focus, um, significant customer in our joint expeditionary world, um, doing a lot, of, a lot of effort for the Marine Corps. Um, we've been working on their COC program for some time, built the initial set of software to operate their COC. Today we are showing the, one of the things with, with having uh, experience and working with canes and reducing the number of systems, we're never going to make the different services use the same software stack to accomplish their missions. So. What we can do, though, is ensure that those services share data seamlessly across their different software stacks for enterprise services. So COC and Canes have leveraged off of each other's software developments as well as NCES at the joint level. And so we're doing a demonstration between Canes, Marine Corps COC, and the NCES cloud to ensure that we can seamlessly federate that data. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So Maritime and Joint C2, um, within, within this sub-portfolio, we're heavily focused on uh, our joint COCOM world, um, doing a lot of things. You know, Charlie's got some folks over at AFRICOM, UCOM, but we're also supporting them with knowledge, um, knowledge superiority kind of capabilities. Um, recently, we have outfitted uh, 
AFRICOM with capabilities, as Charlie said, you know, they don't have all the infrastructure and whatnot. And one of the things they need to do is communicate with their partner nations in Africa without having to lay a huge burden of, of communication capabilities on top of them, like SATCOM and, and um, other RF means to communicate. So we're helping them and partnering with some of the Charlie's folks about what are the applications that are in the open source. They don't have to go buy some DOD system that heavily burdens them with things they don't need. They can go into the open source environment and pull down capabilities that we can communicate with them in. Um, interesting from the standpoint of using open systems, open source kind of capabilities that in our personal world, in the personal world of the U.S. and just the average consumer, um, is used every day. So taking those kinds of capabilities and applying them for the warfighting mission. On Navy Mobile, um, right now we're in the midst of an operational assessment. We are supporting the ground support for the new maritime patrol aircraft, the PA-8A. Um, our system's going through an operational assessment with OPTEV4 in the labs now. Um, we are tied so closely to NAVAIR and that platform um, reaching its operational suitability decisions. And without the ground support, essentially that aircraft doesn't fly. So it's a critical capability that we're providing to the Navy in order to enhance its missions and mission sets. So next slide, please. So our vehicle integrated solutions, you guys, a lot of you are probably familiar with MRAP and MATV. So, you know, I like to think, okay, that's great. But it's in the past. It's what we did. It's not what we're doing. You know, where do we go from there? So right now, we are in the process. We uh, just completed an LRIP production on AFA TIDs, which is the Marine Corps using an Army system for um, artillery tactical decisions. And so we're in a, we just completed about 15 shelters um, integrated as an LRIP. And we're expecting a successful production decision and going to be producing those out of the same facilities we were doing MRAP in. Um, additionally, on top of that, there are some other capabilities that are being added to the MRAP vehicle platform to modernize those. Um, we're doing most of the engineering on that and working with our system center Pacific brethren. And there's so this area with MRAPs also coming back from theater. Um, not sure if you guys are aware, there's about five to 6,000 of the MRAPs going to be stored locally, that the Army's pretty much made the decision. And so maintaining those vehicles is not going to be our task. However, maintaining the operational capability of the C4I as the architectures change across DOD will be our task. So there's still a lot of work going on on the MRAPs in the future. Go ahead to the next slide. So I wanted to share with you some of the areas that we were strategically pressing forward with. So I've got a group that does a lot of, um, I'll call it facilitization and C4I, providing C4I capabilities across various COCOMs and facilities. One of the things we're working towards is developing a stronger relationship with the Army Corps of Engineers and NAVFAC. In other areas, um, have a very strong navigation group. And they're in the midst of modernizing their capabilities and providing navigation services, if you will, into the enterprise service capabilities across DOD. And so we're working on taking those kinds of capabilities and expanding them into the unmanned vehicle arena. We're also trying to advance across, you know, Captain Hoover used to say, a former CO, um, you know, command and control doesn't stop at the brow of a Navy ship. You know, C4I doesn't stop at the brow of a Navy ship. You know, C4I is inherently joint. Our last BRAC in 2005 was about jointness of C4I. And we're working to advance, and I told you a little bit about the Marine Corps and the Navy and, and then the, um, 
at the national level in CES and about ensuring interoperability across all those systems. And we're also trying to build that relationship with the Army and the Air Force to further build upon that so that data can be seamlessly shared across all of DOD. So what's in it for you? Yeah, there's $7 billion of contract ceiling. I know that's a big piece, but, but how can you guys help us? And so I'm looking for industry to come forward with innovation. You know, we're trying to innovate within our own organization, but I recognize that all great ideas aren't thought of here and aren't thought of with the folks that are supporting me. And so we're looking for innovative ideas, new ways of doing things. That's one of the greatest strengths you can bring to the table. Chris talked about diversity, and certainly diversity is a great tool towards innovation. Obviously, I'm a believer that, yes, our nation is having challenges with the economy, but I believe where there's chaos, there's opportunity. I think that within the C4I realm, as we draw down in our budgets, I don't think the C4I realm is going to be hurt as much as if I was building an aircraft or a ship or tanks. I think the platform side, we we're going to have to give on the platforms. So we're going to maintain older platforms out there. So how do you keep them mission capable is by upgrading the C4i. It costs a lot less to pay for C4i than it does to buy new platforms. So I think within the C4i realm, we're going to do well even in the economic environment that we face as a nation. So we need to continue to focus on efficiencies. How can we get better at what we do, leverage it across the board, and cost reasonable amount of resources to provide a capability? And then the other piece is, is you know, I, I started to say when I built this last bullet, you know, I want great expertise from you. I want the highest level of expertise you had. And then I, I, I kind of paused and thought, you know, if I want the best and brightest that you have to offer, well, I'm going to have to pay for the best and brightest. But, you know, I don't always need your brilliant super scientist or super engineer. At times I do. But I also need a good mix, the right level of expertise for what I'm asking you to do. And whether that's somebody bolting on equipment on an MRAP or somebody helping our IPTs design the next widget. You know, what I need you guys to think about is bringing the right level of expertise to bear at the right times. And we'll do questions in a little bit. Um, thank you. And next up is Miss Claudia Kiefer.